Шалом, друзья. Шалом, friends. Эрифтов. Merry Christmas. Хаг, Ханука, Самех. Well, because uh, this video was uh, recorded on the evening of 25th of December, which uh, is the last day of Hanukkah. What a coincidence. What a wonderful coincidence we're having this year. It's uh, the very first time when uh, the majority of uh, Christians in Ukraine from different denominations uh, celebrated Christmas today, not the 7th of January as usually. And in the midst of these circumstances, this year, the end of Hanukkah coincided with Christmas. And it's not the only coincidence we're having. Hanukkah Shabbat was on the 1st of Tevet, which was uh, the day before. And so it was the triple festival. Shabbat, uh, 6th, going to the uh, 7th day of Hanukkah, and Rosh Chodesh. It is uh, quite a biblical festival um, that's not being celebrated nowadays, but uh, we can see it being celebrated again in some uh, uh, movements of uh, Judaism, and it's not all. As you uh, may understand that uh, this uh, week of Hanukkah um, actually coincided with uh, equilibrix. Just asking my friend here. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, the shortest day and the longest night. And then, uh, the following day, uh, the uh, daylight is more and more and more. It's when, uh, it's the time when uh, the night gets its uh, maximum and it, then it gives more and more time to the daylight. So many coincidences, and it's uh, it's quite uh, uh, encouraging for us. Well, and so Hanukkah was met with uh, a lot of events, festive, semi-festive, and um, post-festive. This may help um, to the believers in uh, the God of Israel that in 2023 there will be, there will be a Purim Hanukkah turning point. And if you don't mind, we start uh, our very first seminar uh, at this uh, war time. Our uh, previous seminar was ups and downs of uh, rabbinic uh, literature. We had it just uh, three days before uh, the war began. Well, it's, uh, but actually, the war began uh, in the March of uh, 2014. You know, it was kind of subtle um, at that time. And uh, but uh, we are talking about the event when our 
eastern brother uh, became a cruel aggressor, making a full-scale war. And when we started that seminar on um, rabbinic literature and comments and interpretations, um, it, it seemed uh, so far away from all these trials and tribulations that Ukrainian people faced. But in the course of time, I got thinking God more and more for this uh, opportunity that we had to actually get down to this topic. Not as much uh, because it's quite relevant for um, Ukraine only ministries. Uh, but it was quite relevant for uh, things happening uh, in Europe and Israel, well, and partially America. Because of the war, uh, a lot of refugees from Ukraine uh, got spread around Europe. Some of them got to Israel. Uh, some uh, number of people went to America and Canada, and the number is growing. And also we have uh, congregations uh, planted in Europe, in Western Ukraine, and Israel as well. And uh, there are also some congregations that were there already, they had been there and now uh, they are developing. And so this whole array of congregations, they began to understand that they really need uh, such practical studies regarding rabbinic Judaism. Nevertheless, before we wanted to start uh, seminars of uh, this new season, uh, we handed out a bulletin to our students of the third level of our biblical school and uh, we wanted them to tell us which topic they would want us to do. Top five, number five, Jewishness in the New Testament times who can consider themselves Jewish. Number four, prophecies about Yeshua, Jewish context. Minimum and maximum set of uh, Jewish customs for the congregation to be Jewish and not to be turned into synagogue. Well, that, that's to be honest, was the most intriguing topic. Number two, how to not stop being uh, Mary, uh, Mary uh, when having fellowship with the Holy Spirit and not fall into. Uh, daily affairs. How to keep uh, uh, being merry because of the fellowship with the Holy Spirit and not to make it a routine. Uh, this is a great topic, but it's not really uh, something that uh, we should study at a seminar. It's it's rather something that uh, should be chosen for uh, a set of sermons. Well, uh, or if uh, one was to make it short, it's uh, it would be um, one sermon, one really big and quite serious sermon. And maybe, maybe you disagree with me, but we'll have time to talk about this one. And so, number one, uh, the main principles and signs of revivals. Uh, how does it happen and how is that connected with the Jewish people and the takeaways for modern times? 14 votes, 14 votes for that. It's... Uh, eight votes head start uh, against uh, the uh, second place. 
And since uh, we want uh, to meet um, the wishes of uh, our students, I had to stick with the first topic. Well, on one hand, I had to. On the other hand, I really like it. So, today's seminar, what's it about? Uh, we'll uh, uh, discuss this topic, revivals in Tanakh. Well, obviously, uh, revivals were either uh, revivals of uh, people of Israel or Jewish revivals, uh, including uh, proselytes from uh, other nations, as to say. A brief prayer. Lord Yeshua, we praise you, our King and our God, our Savior, our Mashiach. Thank you that you came down from the highest places, from the high heavens, and came in flesh in Bethlehem of Judah. Thank you that you uh, came poor for us. You left uh, incomparable glory of heaven. And you came on this earth. You didn't come as a great monarch or a leader, not as someone wealthy and powerful, radiant in gems and jewels, but you came as a weak child. You were born in a very poor Jewish family, very poor. And it happened so that you couldn't even been born in uh, your own household, the household of your family, but you were born in a cave. You showed us that we all are pilgrims. Foreigners, pilgrims, this uh, temporary life and uh, this uh, time is only a preparation for the everlasting glorious life if we make our life here on earth worthy of that and so thank you that you weren't just incarnated uh, but you made your way on earth without sin unlike any other man you didn't compromise with the world you didn't compromise with the prince of this world and you willingly underwent crucifixion beatings whippings and you didn't get off the cross, though you could. You bore it all for all of us, for the Jewish people, for all believers. And because of that, the whole world um, is redeemed. You went down to hell, broke off the uh, shackles of death. You came back from the dead. And triumphantly you went back to heaven. So thanks to you, we are set free from hell. We were born of your Holy Spirit. Now we, together with you, can 
to the service to your Father in the Holy Spirit. Thank you for all your festivals. Thank you that you bestowed your grace on us that makes us new every day. It makes our will, our mind, our memory new. And your blood cleansed and keeps cleansing our souls and our conscious is open to your Holy Spirit and its rebukes and its justifications. And may whatever I'll uh, do right be according to your will and what I won't make right, let it be cut off by you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. You know the topic, and we'll start. All uh, the good examples of revivals can be ball, uh, can be found in the Bible. We'll try to get uh, through the list of uh, conditions for revivals to be happening, according to Tanakh, of course. Uh, first one. Mainly, uh, the revivals happened in the end uh, of times of spiritual downfall. But not always, though. Sometimes it was the end of period of outer oppression, uh, persecutions, wars, and so on and so forth. There were occasions when uh, revivals happened because of some uh, natural catastrophes, uh, because uh, God, because of what God sent to His people, because of uh, lewdness of His people, because of the stuff they did. So all these uh, points that I listed, they are interlinked. In the end of uh, period of spiritual downfall and uh, period of oppression and persecution and times uh, when uh, natural afflictions happen to the people of Israel, that could be anything, drought that led to famine, floods, uh, pandemics, etc. So inner spiritual downfall of Israel uh, oftentimes would uh, make the outward uh, enemies of Israel, external enemies, uh, to have access to the people of Israel and to some extent uh, they'd have authority and power over them. So having this access and uh, power and authority, they would they would use it. The oppression would grow and the Israel's uh, situation uh, would become more and more uh, desperate. People would become desperate more and more and more and I'm I'm, I'm uh, not saying anything because I think that you may continue the sentence in your mind and we'll check it people uh, got desperate and turned to their God. Because they had realized that uh, the foreign gods would not save the people. And uh, many of you probably re recalled a vivid example. Israel in Egypt. That's uh, the books of Exodus. Third chapter, verses 6 
through 10. And I will read it. I'm reading from a New King James Version. Well, Moreover, God said, I am the God of your father, he was talking to Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard the cry because of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey let's emphasize a few words so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up. I have come down to deliver them and to bring them up, lift them higher from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, and so forth and so forth. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Uh, well, it's pretty, this, this passage is pretty clear. Uh, this verse, uh, these verses, we can see these principles. When the people of God grew desperate, and as you may recall, they had had some hopes, um, when the previous pharaoh was in charge, was, was ruling over them, but um, when the new pharaoh came to power, things were getting worse and worse and worse, and then they cried out to God, and so God, he by that moment had Moses prepared. He acted swiftly. Uh, the book of Judges has lots of examples like this. Book of Judges and Kings and Chronicles and Samuel. Uh, are showing us uh, clear principles that uh, would occur again and again, and uh, that brings us to your homework. Look for three examples from uh, the book of Judges. Try to find them, um, uh, analyze, uh, try to highlight uh, what's so special about uh, each out of the three examples. Here is a hint internal, inner, uh, down, spiritual downfall of Israel would lead, would make um, external enemies of Israel to rule over them, have power and authority over them. Uh, if people of Israel found themselves in a position where things got worse and worse, and uh, they would find themselves where they would realize that foreign gods will not save them and do not save at all. Three examples like this from the Book of Judges. So now um, a uh, sub point. Reasons. It's important to highlight reasons that would lead Israel to its spiritual downfall. Reasons. 
Итак, причины, которые... reasons that would cause Israel to downfall spiritually, increasing uh, wealth, first of all, of the ruling class, well, it was judges, then uh, kings, princes, elders, and priests. And, uh, yeah, it would grow worse and worse, eventually. Then, uh, some prophets would join this list, or some, you know, some of them so-called prophets. Some of them uh, were prophets and became false prophets. Some of them you know, were false prophets all along. Uh, and they would uh, serve interests of those ruling over Israel. The Elites would uh, grow rich, not caring about what people needed, forgetting their duties before the people, and they would serve their own interests as well as other gods. This kind of backslide would have its way uh, down to top, spreading uh, among the majority of people. And so we're coming back to Exodus. Uh, God warned Moses about these uh, dangers. And God knew that Israel would not be able to oppose it. So God wasn't just warning uh, Moses and the people, but basically prophesying about that. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his way and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and palm grenades, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. Just, just think about it. Uh, 3,500 years back, the land of Israel was full of it. So, verse 9, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten an awful, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which He has given you. Beware! that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, not keeping, in breaking His judgments and His statutes, which I command you today. Which I command you today. Last, when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land were there where there was no water, who brought you water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. 
And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. What a warning. It's pretty serious. And, uh, and a, well, not, not so promising promise, you know, not, not so um, hopeful promise. But sadly, this really happened. All of this really happened. Well, so this is... Uh, reasons the spiritual downfall of Israel another sub point sins of the leaders of Israel sins of uh, higher leadership had the uh, greatest impact on the life of whole nation should I mention uh, that nothing has really changed? Things that were happening at those times, they happen today. No. Uh, increasing wealth, uh, riches. Just uh, people's nature that when they get rich, they rely on this wealth. This is uh, man's proneness to have a lot of money, a lot of everything. Uh, they begin thinking that they deserved it, they gained it fairly, and they begin forgetting. God who has blessed them. So, you know, uh, this is kind of familiar with the second uh, sub-point, sins of the leadership of Israel. Well, all over the world, in every country, um, every nation, well, we can see that uh, the nations, they do what Israel did, uh, they follow the same ways, even uh, so-called Christian nations, they, uh, they do what um, the ancient Israel did. Well, because those nations are so-called Christian, you know, they, they, they are not quite Christian, but they have some um, characteristics of Christianity, and so we, when we read Tanakh, uh, we can see how uh, the the nation was impacted by a sense of leadership, judges, then kings, and I should emphasize this, separate this, high priests, high priests, including families of judges, kings, and high priests. So, at some point, uh, priesthood of Jerusalem and its prophets are included. In some cases, uh, sin uh, that uh, elders and uh, leaders of tribes had could impact the whole nation. And if you so, another task for you: if you can uh, find uh, examples in each uh, of these uh, leadership categories, leadership types. In the times of the Second Temple, informal spiritual influencers got more and more influence. Scribes and Pharisees, their sin were pivotal in a catastrophe that uh, happened in the first 
a century uh, BC kind of continued in the first century AD and uh, uh, it all led to the events of uh, 70 AD which is the destruction of the second temple and Jerusalem and uh, it all climaxed in uh, the end of uh, Bar Kosba's Bar Kosba's revolt. So, another point, imitating gen uh, heathens that surrounded Israel and uh, in the midst of which uh, Israel uh, resided at times. That's another reason for a spiritual downfall. Those were great civilizations of the ancient times like the Egyptian, the Assyric, Syrian, Babylonian, like some civilizations, Lesser. Persia, and uh, that's where we stop, the Persian Empire. I'm not going to continue the list. Though uh, we celebrated Hanukkah, and uh, we all know uh, the connections of this festival, the main uh, connection is uh, Hellenistic uh, and uh, Syrian specific, and well, not only they, uh, the point is that Silivkaid's uh, uh, empire uh, that had lost a nation in it, they tried to suppress the faith of Israel uh, as to say gentilize it or uh, paganize it and uh, take away uh, the faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's what Israel was all about. And when uh, Jews uh, were numb in uh, awe, sometimes trembling, uh, sometimes uh, and reverence uh, when they gazed upon civilization and wealth and development and the power of uh, these great civilizations comparing um, the people of Israel and their faith against um, the things mentioned before uh, the Israelites and their faith looked uh, weak and small, you know, um, not trendy, as to say. And for many, many Judeans, Jews, uh, well, they felt like only by... Uh, imitating uh, all this wealth and power, uh, copying it, uh, having it as an example, now they would uh, join us to the mainstream uh, of the world progress. And as of today, nothing has really changed. We can see stuff like happening over and over again. So there are a few major differences. Back at that time, the time we're talking about, only one nation, Jewish nation, believed in the Lord God. Uh, in one God. Um, other nations, they were idolaters or uh, polytheists. 
though these things they changed a bit but and I think we'll understand it that external uh, features and character characteristics of Christianity uh, do not mean that uh, the nations who consider themselves uh, Christian, Christian do not believe in Christ. It doesn't mean that they believe in Christ. So that's not uh, that's not what it's all about. So the problematic this um, slave-like uh, embracing and submitting themselves uh, to examples uh, that were far away, far away from God and God's uh, word is a relevant, as of today, danger. It goes for Ukraine, it goes for Christians and you know, so-called Christians, um, but it also is relevant for uh, for true believers in Ukraine and who are from Ukraine. Talking about people who moved out of Ukraine. Another sub-point. One of the main reasons of spiritual downfall of Israel were divisions and uh, power games. Another sub-point. Corruption of uh, governmental structures, judges, priests and prophets. Well, as to say, that's something really dear to us as Ukrainians. And I think that uh, there's no argue in uh, these uh, subpoints completely or partially be connected uh, with Ukraine even before the war began and and now as well. So now point point clause point number two. Revival in the ancient Israel happened from the top higher layers um, of society. Uh, it, it was probably a hero of God anointed uh, by the Holy Spirit who would become a judge or a commander of armies. And that's uh, going chronologically. It could be a prophet who became a judge, who would become a judge or a commander of armies. Or maybe it started with a king. It could start with a king of uh, uh, Judea and David's descendants. Northern uh, Israel. What king started revivals? The a revival a revivals could be started by prophets. Would uh, rebuke uh, the people and the king. Uh, this kind of pro uh, these kind of prophets didn't have any political or actual authority, nor economical authority, nor earthly authorities whatsoever. But because of that great spiritual authority and uh, great calling and commission that uh, the Lord himself would uh, bestow on them. The prophet's uh, rebuke would cause a break, uh, 
a, uh, a dramatic change in the minds and hearts of Israelites. And eventually it would lead to a revival. Oftentimes, this kind of prophets wouldn't only rebuke king and uh, people, uh, but also priests and uh, corrupted authorities. So there is something uh, more to think. You know, this is like a homework to you. That'll take some time uh, to study your Bible. For which of uh, the realms, uh, southern and northern Israel, these kind of revivals are uh, a thing, like talking about when a prophet would rebuke uh, the king and the people, the false prophets and corrupted priests. What would start revival? Just reminding you, we are we are studying Tanakh, the Old Testamental books, and this uh, time and period. And uh, just partially, just partially, we we talk about um, time of the Second Temple. You know, since we mentioned Hanukkah, it's the time of the Second Temple, which means that these events happened uh, after the time period of uh, the Books of Prophets. So, revival started with what? So, A. Uh, we mentioned that before, uh, when because of uh, the oppressions, uh, persecutions and war, or natural cataclysms, uh, people began to realize the reasons of their, uh, their adv adversities and would cry out to God. For example, King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. I think uh, you all remember this story. Mm. When the whole nation was coming humble, uh, praying and crying out to God. And there were lots of uh, revivals in the Book of Judges. I can hint you some chapters, like uh, as, uh, as vivid examples. Chapter number three, chapter number four. And the chapter that hits hard in the Book of Judges, uh, we can see a case of uh, profound teshuvah, repentance of Israel. Uh, but it's not uh, something common uh, because um, occasions like this uh, are not very uh, occasions like this are not uh, often didn't happen um, often in Israel and usually uh, Desper desperation would lead uh, the people of Israel to cry out to God and, you know, he's merciful and God loves his people. He would answer. He would answer and would begin saving his prodigal children. Um, I'm not mentioning the chapter deliberately. I'll, ju I'll just give you a hint. Verse 6 of the chapter. 
В этой главе судей, вот как раз этот редкий случай. That's the case of profound teshuva of Israel. Uh, this chapter shows uh, stage by, st by stage why uh, and how Israel found themselves and, uh, found themselves uh, in the tumultuous times and in some of those occasions would end up um, people of Israel coming humble before God would uh, just prostrate, prostrate, prostrate before uh, the throne of mercy, realizing uh, why they had, why, why they, what they had, and so they would repent, would uh, do their true tshuva, turn around, turn away from their sin, and after all that, God would surely act and also some revivals uh, would start with uh, complaints and cry of one man at times just uh, um, going hum humble and crying to God one man was enough well uh, a good example is Gideon well I basically gave you away uh, one of the chapters in the book of Judges so it took one man uh, for uh, Chuva to happen. In the case of Gideon, it was his family. It started with his family. Yeah, it started with his father. After Gideon broke down that oak tree, so then that Chuva would have its way and thralling the whole nation. And in this example, it all started with just one Gideon. And he wasn't uh, kind of cool person. No, he was, uh, was just a man from a small family, from a small tribe, hiding from enemies. So this case shows us that revival started uh, with uh, deep, profound, um, all the way repentance of one man who represented the whole nation. And the, the, and, uh, this case talking about Daniel, for example. So, sub-point. Revival could start after judge or a prophet and in the case of Samuel, it was a prophet and a judge, and, uh, and also king. All they, each one could could uh, talk to people, and the people would come humble. And in one case, it happened because of a scribe, Ezra, and uh, king's servant. Nehemiah, he served to the king of Persia. And sometimes God would use uh, two special prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, as a catalyst of uh, revival. It would be good for you uh, to find examples of these revivals. Now, another point, or clause. Well, we're about to wrap this up, so, fourth point. What was so special about revivals except prayers and 
uh, repentance, rejecting idolatry, destruction of idols, and quitting false spiritual practice, well, sinful practice. Yeah, false spiritual practices like um, sorcery, magic, uh, divinations, and witchcraft. So, rejection, idolatry, destruction of idols, and quitting doing false spiritual practices like sorcery, magic, uh, witchcraft, divinations, and stuff and forth. All of that you can find in Deuteronomy chapter 19. So, second sub-point, and the fourth point, uh, stop committing sin, different types. N another sub-point, people would start God uh, by restoring uh, service that had been commanded by Torah and restoring material service as well, meaning tithes and offerings, and also uh, the change of uh, the way how Jews treated each other take place. Uh, people would quit um, doing uh, godless behavior uh, regarding each other, but they would do good do good to each other, you know, they begin doing good. Another feature is a restoration of reading and hearing, listening the Word of God. Well, we're talking about times when uh, not all people could read uh, the Torah. There were a lot of reasons. Uh, first reason is obviously not all uh, people were educated. The second um, reason is that scrolls of Torah and uh, other um, books of Tanakh, they were very rare and expensive. But uh, hearing the Word of God would, uh, would be a thing during revivals. And some revivals would happen after uh, long-lasting uh, a period of uh, spiritual downfall, um, a scroll of the Torah would be found and King and others would read it, uh, listen to it, would come broken-hearted and would try to do whatever had been written in the scroll as, uh, as the opposition to what had been happening before they had found the Torah. Another sign, another feature of revival is restoration of celebration, resuming of celebration of uh, Lord's festivals. In some cases, in some cases, uh, the covenant had to be made new, re-ratified. Uh, let's take a look into Second Chronicles. It happened during the reign of Asa. Second Chronicles, chapter 14. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places, and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was quiet under him. And he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore, uh, chapter, uh, verse 9, sorry. Then Zira, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men. That's the, the highest number of uh, armed men described in Torah. 
in the Bible and 300 chariots and he came to Marasha. So Asa went out against him and they set the troops in battle array in the valley of uh, Zephtatha at Marasha. And Asa cried out to God, Lord, and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with me or with those who have no power. That's what uh, Maccabees would quote before any battle uh, against um, overwhelming uh, armies of the enemy. Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. They were broken before the Lord and his army. And they carried away very much spoil. Then... Uh, we read uh, verse 15. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. Not Odin. Hmm? Oded. Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without law. And without uh, Torah. If we rephrase it, it's a good prophecy regarding times that uh, came to pass uh, many years after this had been prophesied. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought Him, He was found by them. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, but great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. And it's not just the land of Israel, this prophecy is about, about about many countries of the world. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Odid, the prophet he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh and Simeon, for they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered to the Lord at that time seven hundred bulls and seven thousand sheep from the spoil they had brought. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. What an amazing event! This truly a uh, refreshment, an update of uh, the covenant. They entered it again. Uh, they entered the covenant that kind of they had been in already, but. Uh, Something happened. 
something, meaning events that we have just read, uh, that uh, provoked uh, this change of heart. And it's not the miracles and the victories that made that happen, but the word of the Prophet, his words. These words humbled the heart of the king and the people's hearts as well. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be, be put to death. What an update! What an oath! Whether small or great, whether man or woman, then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns shofars meaning, and all Judah rejoiced at the oath. How could that be? You know, uh, it's an oath that could uh, curse the whole nation and uh, whoever would break this oath, they had to be put to death. But God filled king and prophet and the whole nation so much that everyone was happy, they rejoiced uh, at this oath that obligated everyone from great to small to be faithful to this covenant. For they rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul, and he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all round. Also, he removed Meekach, the mother of Asa the king, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed and burnt it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. It's one of the great examples of profound step-by-step -step revival of Israel. So I believe when we pray for revival, we are to take seriously uh, these examples of uh, revivals of Israel's of Israel, because this uh, prophecy kind of connects uh, that revival with future revivals that happen will happen, and we can have some real good takeaways, and we can see what we need to change, what has to be uh, realigned, uh, what we have to reject, and what we should take courage in for the Lord to truly outpour the rivers of, the, of His Holy Spirit upon us, uh, on all Messianic congregations, on the whole body of Messiah. And who knows, maybe it will enthrall uh, millions of people in Ukraine and uh, of countries where uh, uh, people have moved to. And also, it points out to the thing that God is going to do in the midst of his people. And so, in the final clause, final point, number five. The work, the movement of the Holy Spirit during revivals. And so, it's, it's true that for uh, people to uh, realize their sin and not to put their trust and uh, people not uh, blaming enemies or God or anything else, but for people to come to know, to realize, to understand their guilt, to realize um, the reasons that led them to calamities, for all of that to happen. The movement of the Holy Spirit was necessary, and so God would send Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, uh, to humble and make broken-hearted some individuals and the whole nation of Israel as well. Humbled, broken-hearted and uh, 
repented people would get opened for the further movement of Ruach HaKodesh. And then God could distribute uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit among those um, to whom uh, the revival must had come to pass. So they would uh, encourage people, uh, revive them, uh, so, and uh, deliver the nation from the outward enemies and would uh, provide the victory over inner and visible enemies. Uh, these gifts God would uh, bestow on chosen uh, servants that would lead the people. Well, sometimes it would uh, be vice versa. In, in some cases, God would mark some individuals, would anoint them, would uh, raise them up as well. Uh, he would uh, distribute his gifts to them, or he would maybe just uh, uh, bring to fruition the gifts they had had since uh, the birth. And only after that, there could be uh, movements, actions of the Holy Spirit that would lead uh, the, uh, the rest of Israel to be rebuked, humbled, and uh, they would come to repent. And that's where we stop. That's where we stop. So, the features of uh, the ancient uh, times Israel revivals that we can see in the Tanakh, well, they uh, make us thinking about uh, our times, but where we are right now, the people of Ukraine, uh, the people of Israel, um, where uh, Jews of uh, diaspora and Ukrainians in diaspora, you know, and uh, in some cases those are connected cases. And so after analyzing uh, the features of uh, revivals, stages, steps of revivals, and what uh, which God's uh, actions happened before and during revivals, after analyzing why the people of God needed revivals in the first place, why uh, did the people of God need uh, this kind of shakes when God would rebuke them, would uh, just remove everything that is foreign to him and all uh, sinful stuff. Why did all of that have to happen? Why couldn't people of Israel be just, you know, God line, serving Him, seeking Him constantly? Why couldn't they be committed, devoted to the King of Israel, fill their hearts, serving Him with joy? experiencing uh, true bliss and receiving all the possible blessings abundantly just like the Lord had promised in Torah. Why? Why did the same thing happen over and over again? Like after another shake-up, after another bringing heartedness and repentance, Israel would turn away from the false gods and come away to God. They were ready to do anything for God to forgive them, to have mercy on them, and lift them up from their lowly uh, state they found themselves in. God did that every time. How amazing that is. That God, even in the Old Testamental times, when there was no uh, revelation of the New Testament, when there was a uh, name of God, which is love. God was merciful. He was quick to forgive. He loved to be merciful, 
loving. He, he wanted to save Israel from their troubles. This is so incredible and that is a great example that God will never forsake us unless unless when we even going astray from the narrow path of God uh, we repent after realizing our mistakes uh, we return to God we restore in uh, seeking God and uh, being in this graceful relationship with him God uh, every time when we do that God shows mercy he shows us grace he provides a way out from any circumstances this is an amazing faithfulness of God but that's something that we can find in the epistle of James there is no shade of change in him and everything good and the perfect gift comes from our Father, from the Father, who shines with the light of Mashiach and Hanukkah, and no darkness can abide in this light. This is such a great encouragement for all of us in this 2023, that you know whatever circumstance happens, we are to remember just one thing that God's forgiveness and manifestation of his forgiveness and his protection and support his encouragement his blessings his brachot they are not being bestowed automatically to his people and uh, his children all of that can only happen uh, only after been restored in the right position and right state before the face of the God of Israel. And as we are asking ourselves, when will the revival happen in Ukraine? Well, it's kind of it's kind of as important as another question: When will the war be over? And we all of us. Uh, heard these uh, prophecies that uh, after the war ends the revival ha will happen yet friends studying uh, history of revivals uh, you can see in the Old Testament in the Tanakh I come to clearly understand one real simple thing it's unlikely that the war will be over before revival happens. Usually after the very first stage of revival, God will be able to stop this war. There must be a real revival of faith, a real refreshment of and the whole body of Messiah in Ukraine spiritually. It must happen to all who consider themselves believers in the only God of Israel. When this revival uh, begins to enthrall and captivate millions and millions of believers, this will make God to open the floodgates of heaven that will outpour the rivers of light that will chase away the darkness in Ukraine and over Ukraine then the war will be stopped and after this stage happens the next more serious more profound and continuous uh, stage begins that will make its way in other countries as well I I'm coming to this from studying these examples of revivals that we studied today discussed together God let us seriously uh, 
and creatively at the same time allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and fix our hearts on you when we study the Word of God and have takeaways from it for our time as well as spiritual understandings of uh, the future steps of our history history of Ukraine and the people of Israel as well thank you Lord for your faithfulness and for your desire that um, the ancient history uh, would become for us uh, just the way you meant it to be and so that the takeaways that we have from the biblical history would be markers on our way to us and you have already made your way amen <laughs>